Arts Magic came from, and those that don't know me, I started doing this stuff back in, in seven, I started working for the Colorado DOT in 76, and um, but I want to give you the story where Access Magic came from. So I started in 76, uh, and one day my executive director for the department has lunch with the director of planning for the city of Denver. And they hatched up this plan because the city of Denver wanted to increase the flow capacity, the, uh, reduce the delay to get in, into the central business district. Not the freeway system so much, but all the other state highways that were in the Denver metro area. So they hatched up this thing for, they wanted to increase access control. So they agreed that access control was necessary to improve capacity and travel time into the central business district. So in the summer of 77, after these two guys had lunch, Art, um, I'm sorry, not Art, um, Adam Poe and I were assigned to come up with a commission policy, a three-page, basically vision, mission, strategies, objectives kind of thing. Three pages, you know, what do you, I mean, two pages, what do you want to do? And we got it through the Highway Commission, approved it. So our first objective was to improve current legislation. And so uh, Chief Highway Counsel and I, um, uh, Jim Kurtz Phelan and I, put together basically a three-page statute for Colorado, and then we ran it down to the legislature. And our, uh, oh, I want to point out one thing, especially for Wisconsin. Among other things, it declared that all state highways were controlled access highways. So all 9,100 miles of the state system became controlled access just by legislation. We didn't have to go for our commission. The legislature gave that to us. Thank you very much. They didn't know what they were doing, did they? Uh, <laughs> so, but I, what, what happened was we're down, it was written with the word access control, the whole legislation. So I'm down, we're doing testimony in front of the State Transportation Committee. I'm sitting there next to my executive director. I'm sort of the technical guy, the young kid. I was like in my 20s at the time. And he leans over to me and says, after we're che being chewed on by the legislature, Phil, I wish we'd called it access management, not access control, because access management is, sounds softer. So. We survived. The governor signed, Governor Lamb signed the legislation in the summer of 79. And Jack turns to me again and says, this is Jack Henslinger, who last time I checked this in Washington, D.C. somewhere. Jack directed me to use the term access management in the Colorado rules that I was putting together in the summer of 79. And that's sort of where it came from, was Jack leaning over to me one day in, in a state Senate committee saying, I wish we'd call it access management. It's, it's softer. You know, it's not as hard line. But then I had an issue because I'm, I'm writing all these 50 some odd pages of regulations and the issue was uh, the law saying access control, access control, access control. And so I have to use the term access control, but every opportunity I had, I dropped in access management because the boss said, Phil, but use access management. Um, okay, on, on, to, on to the topic here. Um, one of the things that happened amongst where my notes are. Well, is Christine, me, Virgil Stover, um, uh, Gary, uh, Jerry Gluck, and we were doing all this early stuff in the late 80s and early 90s. We're like, why aren't states just jumping on this stuff? I mean, this, this is so important. It's a great strategy for safety, for operations, protect the, you know, all the reasons we do access management. And why weren't state, states doing it? Even now, there's probably only state, 10 states out there that have good access management, if, if it's that many. And we're always hoping to get someone's attention that someone would sue the hell out of somebody to raise the bar, to raise the interest among states to maybe, you know, work head on access management and start working on the system. And it just dragged and dragged and dragged. So I'm very happy to introduce uh, Ernie Alvino, who's a friend of mine and an attorney in New Jersey. Ernie is the uh, head of Litig the litigation department at Hoffman and Damaso. Close. <laughs> it's like saying Demosthenes, isn't it? In southern New in southern New Jersey, not the other part of New Jersey, and uh, he's certified by the Supreme Court as a certified civil trial attorney. His practice focuses on complex personal injury cases, and his verdicts and settlements have exceeded 160 million dollars, including the largest settlement of a construction accident case in U.S. history. Good morning and thank you for coming. I am suing the hell out of somebody. Uh, and it's going to continue. 
What we're going to talk about today um, is a concept that I had not heard about, this access management term, until about three years ago. That's because about four years ago, a young couple is driving on a motorcycle, husband driving, wife as a passenger, along a four-lane, 55-mile-an-hour state highway. As they rode toward a signalized intersection on a beautiful afternoon, coming in the opposite direction, stopped, waiting to make a left turn in front of them was a pickup truck. The young man in the pickup truck wants to turn left into a driveway of a commercial establishment, a driveway that sat within the state's right of way, within a functional intersection, allowing left turns in and left turns out with not a single control measure to reduce conflicts, something that everyone in this room should know is dangerous. As the motorcycle goes through the intersection, the pickup truck turns left and they collide. The husband lies dying in the roadway. The wife loses two feet of her bowels and breaks almost every bone in her body. And I have the honor to represent her. When another lawyer asked me to handle that case three years ago, I assumed my only case was against the left turning vehicle for crossing the path of the motorcycle. That was three years ago. Two years ago, I sued the commercial owner of that driveway and the state of New Jersey and its Department of Transportation. And the only thing that happened in that intervening one year between when that case came into my office and I filed that lawsuit, the only thing that changed was that I stumbled on the term access management. It is not a term that I or the people I associate with had ever heard. I hadn't heard it in 30 years of practice. But then I began to read. I began to read about driveways and functional intersections and control measures and conflict points. I began to read the materials that were authored by some of the people in this room. So I made a couple of phone calls and I learned more and more. And what I learned was how long that it's been since you folks have known that driveway configurations like the one I described were very dangerous and that they sit there, not upgraded, not fixed in too many situations, and people are dying. And when I did a nationwide search for lawsuits, personal injury lawsuits, like the one I brought, I didn't find very many at all, but I found a ton about condemnation, eminent domain, and those taking cases that some of you have been involved in, where you go to a property owner and say, hey, that's not a safe driveway. Move it or we'll shut it down but very few cases like mine where lawyers and injured clients were suing either the state, the property owner, or both. And I concluded after polling my friends in the business that we just never heard of access management, don't know what it is, and didn't know what to do about it. But there's now a trend, in my view, moving in an opposite direction. I know of four cases, I either know of or I'm involved in four cases out my way on cases like that. And two days ago, into my office walked a mom and dad to talk about their 23-year-old daughter who was sitting in a trauma center with plates and screws throughout the front and back of her hip. Because as she proceeded down a state highway on her motorcycle, a pickup truck made a left turn into an uncontrolled driveway that allowed left in and left out within a functional intersection. So when I get back to New Jersey, I'll be bringing suit against the state of New Jersey and the business owner of that property for that dangerous driveway, it happens to be the same business owner I'm suing for the case I started this discussion about. Because it doesn't pay to upgrade. Nobody wants to shut down left turns because that decreases business for the commercial enterprise. And as Bob and I were discussing at breakfast, the people in this room who work for DOT, you're strained. Uh, resources are limited. You can't inspect every driveway. You can't get to them all. But it's going to potentially expose people to liability from lawsuits. And I'd like to begin this discussion, and we don't have a lot of time. In the beginning, I want to talk about cases against property owners, private owners or controllers of those driveways along state highways, and then turn my attention to the public agencies and the potential legal exposure they have. 
I, I really would like to talk more about that DOT stuff because so many of you are from that world and not many of you are from the property area. So I'm going to try to race a little bit through the first part on property owners and spend some time with DOT and maybe talk about Wisconsin because I've done a little research on that and, uh, and talk about sovereign immunity. Now, let me just back this up for a second and see where I am. So who's accountable potentially in a lawsuit, personal injury lawsuit, for a dangerous driveway configuration? Well, the obvious is we can hold the driver who made the left turn, for example, accountable. They're almost always accountable in those 1,700 crashes a day when someone's at fault. Can we hold the property owner accountable, the private developer? Let's say it's a commercial establishment that invites people in and out of that driveway to get to its store. Because without that private driveway, the crash would not have occurred. Without the, the invitation of the public to make the turn, the accident would not have happened. And can we hold the agency accountable for either allowing that driveway in a permitting process or allowing it to remain for years? So a driveway owner's protection from the state's regulatory power differs from the owner's common law duty. I'm now focused on the owner of this property, and I'm making a distinction between two separate concepts. One. The relationship between the state and the property owner under regulatory power, access code, statute, administrative code, where the state can come in and either condemn the property, it's an eminent domain situation, they can take it, they can make you move it, that's on the one hand, versus what we will discuss is common law, judicially created laws by courts that deal with the relationship between the injured person and the property owner because they are different. So does a property owner who constructs or maintains a driveway on a public right-of-way pursuant to a permit or grandfather clause owe a legal duty to the injured person? Now, when it comes to the um, permitting situation, let's talk about my example. In 1965, before the state has an access code, and as Phil said, not every state has them, and the ones that do not, don't always have a great one. New Jersey's was in the uh, late 80, 80s and one of the first, I think Colorado, Florida, Jersey. Let's say in 1965, before any access code exists, the property owner builds a driveway within the functional area of a signalized intersection on a four-lane arterial. It allows left in and left out. There's no control measure, and the conflict points are ridiculous. And everybody in this room knows that's dangerous, okay? That's my hypothetical, my scenario. Driveway exists before a permitting process. Then, in 1979, the state enacts an access code, and it grandfathers in this 1965 driveway, this old driveway. But in the intervening years and decades, this nonconforming use allows left turn accidents to continue to occur. The property owner gets sued by my client because of one of these left turns. And the owner says, wait a minute, you can't sue me, Ernie. I've got a permit or I'm grandfathered in. And that's the conflict. The property owner is going to say, I have a permit or I have a grandfather clause. You can't sue me for your client's personal injury. And the answer is, sure, I can. On the left side, there's an administrative law, which is the state's ability to condemn or to take the property pursuant to an access code or regulation, which differs from the common law, judicially created law, made by judges and courts, which says at the top, every state in this country has a law, a common law, that says a property owner, especially a business, that invites someone on to spend their money has a legal duty to keep that property safe. The business owner that knows or should know of a dangerous condition can't allow it to happen because if someone comes on there and gets hurt, they can sue the property owner. Several states have case law now that says that applies to the duty of a property owner in an access management context. Left in, left out, in a dangerous configuration will subject you to lawsuits if you're a property owner in at least those states, and it's about to happen in my state and Pennsylvania. So the distinction between the property owner having a dispute with the state under administrative codes versus a dispute with my client in common law are very different things and it does not protect the property owner if he or she has a permit. That grandfather clause does not protect them from liability, not in my state, 
and I doubt in most states too. So again, grandfather protects against the taking of it on one hand, but it does not protect you in a common law scenario where the owner knows or should know of a dangerous condition. Now that's an important concept to grab onto, the know or should know. I am not saying that a business or property owner with a bad driveway is automatically at fault when I sue them. What I'm saying is that they're going to be at fault if they either knew or should have known before my client's injury that that driveway was dangerous. How? Prior accidents. Other left turn in and out accidents have occurred that give the owner notice or knowledge that, hey, this may be dangerous. That's when the duty attaches for the owner. And what is the duty? What is the obligation legally on the property owner? It's the duty to upgrade and fix it. Every state's common law says that if an owner knows of a dangerous condition on property, it has a duty to fix it to prevent more injuries. In your industry, Box was saying it in the 60s about the duty to upgrade. To make, once you have an improvement, to continually analyze and develop data and look for weaknesses in the design. The transportation research folks talked about the same thing in 1992, just as examples. But that follows the common law. If I know as a property owner of a dangerous condition or should, I have a legal duty to fix it. If I do not, I will be held responsible for injuring someone. That means that, and there may be one or two people at this um, convention who either are private developers or work for them. I realize that's not the majority of people. But if the private developers hire experts like, like you to go out there and, and, and build a driveway or design a driveway, your knowledge of the research in this field about the dangerousness of these configurations is going to be imputed to the owner. It's going to mean that the owner, by virtue of hiring experts, has knowledge that driveways with dangerous conditions should be upgraded. And let me pause and just kind of give you an example from a case I'm handling. The driveway that my client on her motorcycle was injured in was built in 1969, well before New Jersey even had an access code or, or a real significant permitting process. So when we did have our access code, that driveway was grandfathered in, which meant that they didn't have to move it unless the state said they had to move it. And so they let it sit within a functional intersection, left turns in, left turns out, conflict points all over. They knew it was dangerous. This is a, this is a huge corporation that owned this property. Knew it was dangerous, but they didn't upgrade it because they said, we're grandfathered in, we don't have to. But accidents were happening over and over again, left turn in, left turn out, and just six miles up the road, that same corporation in 2000-ish built another convenience store and tried to put a driveway with left turns in a functional intersection with no control measures. And the state DOT, by that time we had a permitting process, stepped in and said, you can't do that, it's dangerous. Shut it down. Left turns in a functional intersection with no controls are dangerous. There were public meetings, and I have the transcripts where this corporation and its lawyers and its engineers appeared and they got screamed at by the borough people that said left turns and functional intersections with no controls are dangerous. State says so you're not allowed to do it on this new project you're building. So they conformed to the current standards in 2000-ish. But what did that mean? It meant that six miles down the road, the same configuration that had been dangerous since the 60s, they let it sit because they said, well, we're grandfathered in. So we know it's dangerous in present day, but we're going to leave our old stores that are dangerous, we're going to let them sit because we've got this grandfather clause. Not going to work. They had notice of what was dangerous decades before, and they let it sit. Accidents kept happening, and my contention is they're going to be at fault for that. Owners, at least in my state and many others, are the ones that get the access permit in New Jersey. Not tenants, but owners. So while the owners have this half-assed argument, and I apologize to Ben, he mentioned longshoremen, lawyers and longshoremen. I was not a longshoreman, but I was a teamster. I drove a beer truck in Atlantic City to work my way through school, and sometimes the language gets a little spicy. So I apologize. So you have a guy from New Jersey who was a teamster, so you know. Uh, 
All right, so the owners in New Jersey have the permit, get the permit, get the benefit of the grandfather. It's not going to work for them, but at least they can hold up a grandfather clause or a permit. Tenants don't get the permit in New Jersey. They have no rights. Now, in my case, the convenience store that um, it was involved in the original motorcycle accident I told you about actually rented the store, rented the property. They're not the owner. They don't even have the permit. So they're kind of wide open for exposure. So if you're in the private development arena and you're an owner or tenant of private property, do not assume that the grandfather clause or even a permit issued by the state will protect you from a personal injury lawsuit because the common law says, I suggest you, it will not. Now. Yes. Before I say it again, let me talk a little bit more about Wisconsin. How many people do we have from Wisconsin DOT? Oh, that's fabulous. I, I, have a, a, I have a good friend who's a personal injury lawyer out here at a very prominent firm, and I have not made the phone call to him, and out of respect to the people in this room, will not. That's his business. Um, but if he ever gets a hold of you, um, they're bringing you out of retirement, my friend. All right. Wisconsin, as I read it, has some exceptions to immunity. And I just want to make the argument. I'm not saying it's accurate, but I want to make the argument. There's something called a known danger exception in Wisconsin, where the public entity can be sued. It's, it's something such a damn obvious danger, and Wisconsin is compelled by rule or law or code or statute to fix it, and they don't, then they can be sued. So it's a pretty limited, um, it's limited for, for folks like me. It's hard to prove. But if it's one of these crazy, obvious conditions, and they know about it, and they have no discretion but to fix it, they can be sued for it. Here's the argument. And I got all of this the other day off of your public website, your DOT website. So maybe you don't want to publish so much on the website, but that's your business, OK? Lawyers like me love when you guys are so transparent. Uh, you should take a lesson from Washington, maybe pull that stuff down. Um, in your state trunk highway STH connection permit stuff, you tell us that permits can be revoked, of course, if the driveway during the capital improvement project inspection is non-compliant. Okay, so you have a policy where you're going to do inspections of driveways during capital improvement projects, and you find that it's dangerous, and you can yank the permit for these people, and you can even shut down the driveway if you have an access road. And most states, I think, have that, or hopefully, hopefully most states will have that regulation soon. And here's what you write. We may pull this permit. This may occur when the connections along the highway, for example, are within an improvement project. So you have a policy of inspecting during improvement projects, and you can yank a permit. You say the same thing in your facilities development manual. It's section 15. Here's what you say. During the improvement project review, we will identify driveways that have the potential to be moved to a safer location or be completely removed. Discuss this with the property owner and desire them to make changes or shut them down. As conditions, here's important stuff, as conditions change over time, a driveway authorized previously, meaning it has a permit, may become unsafe. If adequate changes cannot be made to the driveway, then the authorization, the permit, may be revoked. If alternative access exists, the parcel may be issued a notice of non-access, meaning you'd shut it down. Now, to me, in my business, what that tells me is you're acknowledging DOT to the world that you will do the inspections during the improvement projects, you will look for unsafe driveways, and you recognize that what might have been a safe driveway when you issued the permit may become an unsafe driveway as conditions change, as time goes on. Maybe it was safe in the 60s. Maybe the literature wasn't clear. But then as the years and decades roll on, it becomes apparent to you that's not a safe driveway. You are obligating yourself, my argument is, to ensure that that, mo that owner of that property changes that driveway or you will shut it down. It is a known danger to you. You have no discretion but to make it comply. That's the argument. And if that argument is accurate in Wisconsin, you fit into the known danger exception and can be sued. I'm just making the argument. I don't know that that's ever been decided by a court in Wisconsin. But you're publishing that you know it's dangerous. You're publishing that you have a policy that says you'll make it safe. Thank you, Phil. 
And if you don't do it, a lawyer is going to make that argument. What else have you published in Wisconsin? You guys, are the, I, only had, I only did this for half an hour. God knows if I had a day, you know. <laughs> you have a Wisconsin Strategic Highway Safety Plan, 2014 to 2016. The frequency of left turn crashes, which are widely recognized as the highest risk movements at signalized intersections, are one of your outputs. You're acknowledging, which you have to, left turn accidents are really, really dangerous. In your permit condition manual, you restrict turning movements to right in, right out. And you make sure directional movements are entrance only and exit only. So you know and recognize that you need control measures in there. And if you don't have them, that can make it unsafe. You also recognize in your administrative access control, section 8425, Left turns are the most critical to control since that movement usually involves yielding to other traffic, which may need to clear the intersection. Again, you're acknowledging that left turns are unsafe. And this one I love too. This is great. This is from one of your FDM 1125's intersections at grade. Corner clearances to driveways. Now, I'm a plaintiff's lawyer and I'm reading this, which is notice, my argument is, to the state of Wisconsin about what it knows to be dangerous, okay? In your words, driveways are, in effect, intersections. Their design and location merit special consideration because crashes are disproportionately higher at driveways. Ideally, driveways are not located within the functional area of an intersection. Ideally, driveways are not located within the functional area of an intersection or the influence area of an adjacent driveway. Access connections too close to intersections can cause serious traffic conflicts that impair the function of the affected facilities. Take all that together, and you have the driveway configuration that killed my lady's husband and disemboweled her. You've acknowledged on your website that left turn driveways are the most dangerous. Driveways should not be in functional intersections. You should have control measures in your driveways you have a policy of inspecting for dangerous driveways like that. And if you come upon them during the capital improvement project, you will do something about them. You've just laid out my case. And if it were in New Jersey, it'd be over a long time ago. You have admitted in your writings to knowing these things are dangerous and that you have a duty to do something about them. Whether some court will eventually hold you responsible when these kind of left turn accidents happen, I don't know. But you have written. You have written that driveways that were once safe can become unsafe with time. You know it. The literature's been clear for 50, 60, 70 years on those kind of configurations being dangerous. There is no escaping when a lawyer like me sits you in a, in a testimony setting, in a deposition, and says, did you guys know that driveways like that are unsafe? What are you going to say? Yeah. You're going to say, Bob said we don't have any dangerous driveways in the state of Wisconsin. Um, question? I think it would help you, I'm going to, because it's a discretionary act, what we call in the law a discretionary act, meaning if you have the, dis the discretion to issue or not issue, at least in my jurisdiction, it protects you. Whether that protects you in Wisconsin, I can't give you a legal opinion on it. Um, I can tell you this, though. You're still allowing the creation of a dangerous condition on public property. <laughs> well, OK. I'm, I'm suing you anyway. I mean, you can figure out. <laughs> You'll be on my side. We may have an answer in the back. All right, so in the exercise of discretion, you're going to be fine. The only thing I question on that is it kind of seems to conflict with the law, at least in my state, that says, but if I give a permit, I'm a DOT. I issue a permit for the construction of a dangerous condition on public property, now I'm stripped of immunity. So there's almost a conflict between, the, at least in my state, the ministerial and that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the argument that I've been making out east. Just if Phil will give me 30 seconds, I know I'm running late. To kind of answer the question in a roundabout way, what would I do? I mean, listen, I'm not connected to the Wisconsin DOT. I would inspect the hell out of these driveways. 
and I would make every single owner fix them or shut them the hell down. And then you're not going to have a problem because you don't want to be the test case when that wave of litigation comes because uh, uh, at least in my, on the East Coast, there aren't that many of these cases. They're coming. I've got two. I know about it. I've read the literature. I've told my friends. We've got four or five going now. And it may not be an explosion of litigation, but when you have this much knowledge on the literature out there, and you're the state, it's really hard to say, we didn't know it was dangerous. Your best defense is, yeah, we knew it was dangerous, but kind of somebody else is at fault. You're the state. Juries don't respond to that real well when somebody's you know, lying dead in a roadway. My two cents. I'm over time. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah.